that in case someone looks at me and think, what happened to him? Welcome to the Nehemiah Entrepreneurship Community Podcast. I'm your host, Patrice Sage, and I am here with a good friend, a longtime friend, Chris King. Chris, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Patrice. Well, Chris, before I introduce you, uh, you were telling me before we got into the podcast what happened to you. Great cause, but it's a tell our audience what happened. Chris always looks so perfect, but today he... Well, I was I was telling you that I was super sensitive, but I said I need to get past my pride and do this. Uh, I was, uh, uh, we went over to the beach on Sunday with, uh, with my children, and I was body surfing in the waves with them, and I'm not very good at it, and I, I hit the bottom, and it scraped up my head, and it was lucky that it wasn't anything more significant, but I don't look very good. So, <laughs> well, you know, um, Chris, you, you're known for precision and for perfection. It's good to know you're human like all of us. Thank you. Yeah, well, you, you found your crook tonight. That's right. Body <laughs> surfing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, welcome to our podcast. So uh, we've asked Chris to come because, as all of you know, we're doing this um, serious discussion around the George Floyd incident. And today we have Chris King. And today we're going to deal with it from a social and political angle uh, because we've had pastors, we've had business leaders, and from a business actually and political angle and, and social as well. We've had a number of folks come up and share perspectives around the George Floyd incident. And we wanted to get someone to speak from a political angle, particularly somebody who ran on the Democratic ticket because we have a number of folks scheduled who ran on the Republican ticket. We wanted to make sure we get that other perspective as well. And Chris uh, was uh, agreeable to come on and we really, really appreciate it. But let me tell you who Chris King is. He's not only a friend, uh, he he's, um, also has been instrumental in, in the vision of the EMI project, but he's a founder and chief, sir, and chief executive officer of Elevation Financial Group. Under his leadership, Elevation has developed a consortium of companies specializing in real estate investment, property management, and property renovation. Mr. King oversees a group of affiliate companies that have successfully launched seven private real estate investment funds and currently own and operate assets in nine states in the union. Under his leadership, Elevation has developed a network of hundreds of private investors across the United States who have supported Elevation efforts to re revalidize and preserve affordable housing while creating a profitable return. Uh, he's a man of faith. Uh, he's also a graduate of Harvard University. Yes, Chris is a Harvard. He ran for governor and was able to receive 4,000 votes. And they came this close, him and his partner for being governors because he then later on joined um, the, uh, the, 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 the leading um, contending for the Democratic Party as I think it's vice vice governor or whatever the term is for that as his uh, lieutenant um, uh, for the Democratic Party. So he all became this close for being in the mansion. Also, one thing that's unique about Chris is his passion for philanthropy. Most entrepreneurs first acquire their wealth before they start giving it away. Chris gave it as he was building it. He has a tremendous philanthropy. He has Elevation Foundation. Uh, which is a public charity that address a public charity that addresses inequality through education and entrepreneurship. He's founded the Elevation Scholars Program, where the best in class initiative provided uh, provide provides college admission and opportunity scholarships to high performing students, leaders from low income high schools. He works also 
His work also includes supporting charitable development programs in Haiti, Africa. And as I say, he's been instrumental within the Imap Project as well. And he actually, Chris, you, you wouldn't believe this, right before this meeting, I was on the, I was organ coordinating a partners meeting with the, with the partners of Elevation College in Congo Kinshasa, talking about the uh, preparing for the opening of the new building that they're building Kinshasa to open Elevation uh, elevation Campus 2 and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So I uh, know that the seed that you sow in, in Congo Kinshasa is bearing fruit and it has even, a, even a more tremendous vision ahead of it. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's great to be here. Patrice, we're a big, Big fan of you. I feel like I've known you a long time. And yes, we have, brother. You, you have introduced me to people and places in the world I'm not sure I would have uh, gotten to if I had not uh, been introduced by you. So we, we've made memories in all over Africa and Haiti and other places. So grateful to be here. Well, Chris, um, thank you for agreeing to be a part. You, you know what's happened uh, around the country. So what is your take on this George Floyd incident and how, how, what do you think about the nation's response? Well, clearly, uh, and I have, I've been out there speaking about this quite a bit. Uh, this has been incredibly tragic for the country. Um, Kristen and I uh, were uh, really uh, horrified by what uh, occurred uh, in Minneapolis. And, you know, in 2020, uh, to watch a police officer with three other police officers standing by uh, put, his, uh, 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 put his knee on the neck of an African-American man and hold it there for over eight and a half minutes and kill him uh, while being videotaped on a, on a phone uh, was something that was just very hard uh, to watch. And one of the things I've I've really said, you know, a very basic thing to do, Patrice, uh, that I tell a lot of friends, particularly some of our white friends who are trying to really understand the, these issues, is just watching the video, just watching it and watching those minutes go by. There's so much that happens as it relates to uh, what the police officer did, how he was warned to stop what bystanders were saying, how they were begging, how Mr. Floyd was, uh, was hurting and asking for him to stop. Um, it really um, is illustrative of this larger issue in the American public life uh, that one pastor said to me, and I think captured it, uh, that in many cases, white America has had the, the knee on the neck of black America for 400 years. And we watched that in eight minutes and 46 seconds uh, with the murder of George Floyd. Wow. Friends, who, if you're watching this on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, wherever you are, you can comment, you can share your questions. We will share it and, and invite you in the discussion. Um, Chris, you read uh, our response, the Nima Project response. Um, what are your thoughts there about our particular response? Well, sure. Uh, you know, and I don't think there was anything in the response that I would uh, necessarily have disagreed with it. Um, certainly, um, I, I believe that the solutions moving forward um, are going to involve matters of the heart, uh, matters of, of faith and changing uh, the heart of America. But it, they're also going to involve and demand uh, political courage, political leadership, and political solutions. And I think, you know, your your voice and the wonderful voice of Nehemiah on these issues uh, has to be more measured on some of the political uh, leadership that's required now. Uh, however, I would say that, you know, this is, this is a time for great leaders uh, amongst both parties to stand up and have their voices uh, have their voices heard. You know, one of the things I often heard, Patrice, when I was in politics, I'm sort of a, I'm sort of retired from that now, but I recognize that I still have a, a good platform to be able to speak to these these things. 
Uh, but one of the things I often heard, particularly in the white community, was a very, a very um, a simple phrase. You've probably heard it, too, where people say, I don't want to be political. I don't want to get involved in politics. I don't want to I want to be above that. And, you know, when we hear that or when we say that, we have to kindly and sweetly say, well, you know, good for you that based on your position of privilege, you have that luxury. Uh, but for millions of Americans, they have to rely on politics and public leadership, because if you don't have affordable housing, it's political leadership that is going to be fighting for it. If you don't have access to health care, uh, if you believe we need true criminal justice reform, you know, that is coming out of our political process. And so, you know, it is the essence of privilege uh, to say that we're any one of us is above politics. I recognize it's messy. It's nuanced. It's complicated. Uh, but it's where real transformation comes from. Mm, mm, good thoughts. You know, you've made a lot of points there. I'm going I'm to get back to it because of the fact that what I appreciate about some of what you're saying, you're daring to say things that many would not say. And I'm going to ask you a question about some of those thoughts, particularly in justifiable or in, 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 um, in comparison to what some have said on this podcast so that, that we can kind of explain it a little, a little bit more. But let me, you as a businessman and an aspiring politician, you say retired, maybe it's temporarily paused. We'll see what happens in the future. But um, you've historically have made a point to support urban initiatives, uh, your foundation, uh, your personal giving, uh, even your very organization, your business, uh, your economic engine is all about uh, bringing innovative, uh, affordable solution in urban communities. Um, why have you had such a commitment or heart, Chris, concerning the uh, minority community, African community, or the urban, the urban community in general? Well, I think it's just, it's my passion. Um, I find it uh, to be incredibly interesting uh, and gratifying work. Uh, but I think it first starts from a position of even perspective. You know, I don't look at myself as someone um, who is uh, who is is necessarily doing something hugely significant for someone else or for some other community. I look at it more as about how do we build extraordinary, wonderful relationships across racial and ethnic eth ethnic boundaries um, that that can bring people together and do great things. And I think what when when someone takes a close look at our work, whether it's in business and affordable housing, whether it's in our foundation and our work in Haiti or Africa of the years past or our work today uh, in Title I Central Florida high schools. I mean, this fall we'll send 27 largely uh, people of color, young, uh, low income, highly talented students to some of the greatest universities in America. I mean, we have students going to Harvard, Stanford, Duke, Wake Forest, University of Florida, FAMU, all across the country. Um, and these were students that oftentimes are overlooked, even though they're amazingly talented. So I see it as an incredible opportunity uh, to, to find talent uh, in places where our society has not always looked for it and to give it the opportunity uh, to go out there and be all that it can be. I think that that is the essence of leadership. That's what we've tried to do. That's what we need more of uh, in our political world. Wow. What an effective use of privilege. Harvard grad, entrepreneur, uh, and you're leveraging all that and taking a risk in coming to a space that uh, doesn't really have a strong promise return and bring your philanthropy into a space that's underserved. Um, but bringing the best that you got in there, I mean, that that's worth noticing. Chris, let me back up a little bit. You made a statement uh, about what the pastor said to you about the fact that the eight minutes and so many seconds, that time being compared to how, what that whites have had have uh, treated African-Americans 
for the last 400 years. Some might hear that um, and and say and take issue with it or feel as though that's in a sense suggesting that all whites have been part of the problem with African Americans. Speak to that a little bit because I think there are some whites right now who feel that what this incident has done made them feel, uh, whether it's true or not, that's how they're feeling, that they're feeling as though they they have to, they're put on the defensive. Could you clarify that or at least speak to that? Well, you know, I would, as, as kindly as I could say it, um, I would say those voices are wrong. Um, you know, there's, there's almost sometimes even the, the notion in nature, there's a, there's a concept called white fragility um, that we often see a lot, that, that any time, uh, you know, the white community um, has to deal with difficult truths, uh, as you just said, well, they're on the defensive, you know, uh, who, who, who are you to say that I wasn't as open minded or I wasn't as fair? You know, and what I say is, again, that's a very privileged position uh, to be in. Uh, but, you know, Kristen and I have chosen to use our voices and our platforms uh, to call that out because the facts are undeniable, uh, Patrice. Uh, I'm in Florida and in Florida, we have an affordable housing crisis. We've had it for over a decade. It's killing communities of color. And our state leaders have been stealing, raiding, looting, looting the very money of two billion dollars uh, to, to date that goes towards building the affordable housing that serves those communities. In Florida today, there is study after study that blacks and whites that commit the same crime get different time, get different penalties. It's undeniable. Facts are facts. In Florida today, we have millions of people disproportionately, communities of color, disproportionately black Floridians that don't have access uh, to health care. I think one of the things we're going to see, Patrice, you're familiar uh, with the Paycheck Protection Program, what's often called in the media PPP, uh, which, which businesses across uh, the country um, took advantage of here in, in the last few months to try to survive these very difficult times. And that was, that was an innovative, quick, efficient thought on how to do it. But my belief is we're going to see that it was the larger, more powerful, wealthier, generally whiter businesses uh, they got access to those funds who had the better relationships with banks. Mark my words, that's going to be a story over the next two years we're going to be talking about. So when it comes to political power, when it comes to, um, we talk a lot about, I know in Nehemiah, black home ownership or black wealth or black owned businesses. Well, when we look at those statistics next to, to white, the numbers, the delta is enormous. So when I say 400 years, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of a lot of folks that can back that up with a lot, a lot of data. Wow. Good stuff. Now, let's talk about you also mentioned politics being a key equalizer. Some would argue that, Chris, you're in a sense suggesting that we have to leave it to government. So you're an entrepreneur, you're a free enterprise guy. So could you balance for me between what you think the role of politics is in this role and why you're urging people to be active politically while, while at the same time where business might fit in? Because you, you, you do a little bit of both or you do a lot of both. Could you speak yeah. to that? Yeah, I would, I would say I would totally disagree with the statement that this is only about what the government can do uh, for uh, the country. And I think my life um, ha has, has certainly demonstrated that. I'm a big believer in the power of, of what I call kind of socially conscious capitalism, business folks, uh, men and women who want to take care of their employees, provide health care, build businesses uh, that serve the common good, that have multiple bottom lines. I believe in that. I believe uh, in, in, in conscious capitalism. 
Um, I believe in the faith community. You know, I've, I've, I've been a person of faith and a Christian since I was a, a young boy, and that's a huge part of Kristen's story as well. And we both see the faith community as being uh, the, the best source uh, of hope and transformation uh, for so many difficult issues and for so many people. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are things that only the government can do. You know, only the president of the United States right now has a bully pulpit to speak to the entire world and try to make sense of the moment we're in. I mean, look at this moment. America is in a really difficult uh, moment. I mean, we are dealing with an extraordinary, unprecedented pandemic uh, that has ravaged small business. Uh, that has made our markets incredibly volatile, uh, that has created amazing amounts of unemployment uh, throughout America. And I can't, you know, I'm sitting here today in our office so thankful we have a company and, and a job to be able to provide for our employees, but there are millions of people without that. In combination, we have in a really what has almost become an international incident uh, sparked by George Floyd's death where uh, people of color uh, allied with, with all races and all religious denominations are standing up and saying, we have a problem in America around the issue of systemic racism. We need our leaders to speak to it and we need them to help us cast a vision uh, to deal with it and become a more just country. And what we've seen in Washington and what we've seen here in Florida is that our leaders are not matching the moment of our time. I would argue that's undeniable. And there's evidence of that every day. And it's, it's creating pandemonium and havoc. And that, that is why leadership is so important because when people are angry and I don't in any way um, condone some of the bad behavior that has come out of this looting or stealing or people that have tried to take advantage of this moment and have hurt communities. Uh, we don't want to see that. that. That doesn't make any sense for moving the ball forward. But if we don't understand the anger and frustration felt by millions of Americans in this moment, we miss the moment. Our president is missing the moment. In my state, our governor is missing the moment. And I think people of goodwill have to be honest about that and stand up. Because if you don't, you're being silent. You're being silent. And you're not helping and you're not being an ally to people who are watching. And that's what I found, Patrice. And if anyone's listening, and I'm sure you have some folks that might listen to this and they may disagree with everything out of my set of my, my, my mouth. Uh, but I can tell you, uh, when you, when you really are connecting with people who have, who have dealt with the injustices of systemic racism all their life. I mean, every, every one of, uh, the black pastors that have become like members of my family has told me about how one of the first things they do when their children become teenagers is they communicate exactly what you're supposed to do if ever pulled over by a policeman, to be enormously cautious, to be enormously careful uh, because you're vulnerable. You know, I've never had that conversation with my children. I'll never have to have that conversation with my children because I don't get that. I don't understand it. Uh, but to the person, they communicate it. Uh, and, and that's something that, that I've tried to process and understand at a deeper level. Wow. Chris, 29 years ago, we had the Rodney King incident, if you remember. Um, it didn't catch nowhere near, it, though it was a major issue. It was very brutal, even more brutal than this one, except Rodney King didn't die. But physically, it looked horrible. Um, the nation didn't respond the same way. What's the difference? Somehow this response, uh, the, a number of whites uh, from all sides, I might think everyone I've talked to, have been grieved and felt as though this has to stop. There's almost an urgency across 
the aisle and across the races. What's different between this and 29 years ago, you feel? Um, well, I, I would say um, one, you know, and I've asked that to a lot of my friends who were who have been civil rights uh, icons in Florida for years, you know, who are older and more seasoned and who have watched this happen time and time again. Many of them have told me it is the younger generation uh, that is both white and black and many different other shades uh, that is out uh, saying uh, this will not be tolerated. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I was super um, privileged to be involved when I was running for office. There was a, a very similar situation of a young black man who was murdered in Clearwater, Florida, by the name of Marquise McLaughlin as part of what's called Florida's stand your ground law, a really bad law in my view. And uh, this man, while with his his two sons and a daughter, um, were, was was shot in front of a like a 7-Eleven type place. And the sheriff said didn't have enough evidence to arrest the person who had shot him. And we marched over there and we uh, raised a holy, you know what, for uh, a number of weeks. And when, you know, the state attorney um, and, and other candidates did as well, we weren't the only one, but I was very proud that I think we met the moment and there. And I got to know Marquise's mother quite well. I went to his funeral. Uh, I spoke to her from the pulpit. I got to speak with a bunch of religious leaders from the pulpit. And what we saw there is you actually really can make a difference. The state attorney weeks later brought charges against the man uh, who had murdered Marquise, and today he's in prison. Uh, whereas the sheriff first said, not going to happen, no, not enough evidence. So I think that's the key. But I, I would only slightly maybe disagree with one part of your, your phrase when you said people across both sides of the aisle, because I think this is the danger of the moment. No doubt, Republicans, Democrats, white, black, everybody in between, I think there is a growing consensus that we have, uh, we got to deal with racism in a more substantive way than we've ever done in America. Where there's not consensus is how we do that. Uh, where there's not consensus is what are the policies that we're going to embrace or get behind um, that are going to actually move the ball forward. And so my fear in moments like this is that when we don't have leaders, which I clearly don't believe we have uh, in Donald Trump or in my governor here in the state, my governor did not speak about this issue for eight days after uh, George Floyd was murdered, eight days, and then only in the context of looting, um, saying he was very concerned about the protests, um, you know, that is a little bit of a signal to me and should be a signal to all of us. And we, we all followed what Donald Trump has done from the White House, that I'm not sure a lot of big, bold, fresh thinking is going to be coming on how to combat this. In fact, here in Florida today, I'll end with this point, Patrice, uh, the greatest civil rights advancement over the last two decades, something called Amendment uh, which would restore the right to vote for people who have already served their time in prison. Because in Florida, we have millions of people who are disenfranchised. And when you're disenfranchised, it affects your ability to care for your family, uh, to be able to have a second chance at pursuing your dreams, even after you serve your time. In the faith journey, we call this grace, but somehow in Florida politics, we have an antiquated uh, law in place. Well, the citizens of Florida, Republicans and Democrats, passed it overwhelmingly uh, in, in my election of 2018. And to date, our governor and his supporters have been fighting it in the courts and successfully fighting it, I might add, uh, to prevent its execution and inaction. Uh, and to me, that's a big glowing uh, opportunity if Republicans and Democrats came together and say, let's see the light on this and let's really put our, our money where our mouth is, that would make a difference in Florida.
Wow. And we'll get into some of that policy because we didn't want you to address the, the political situation. And, and, and because you, you ran for office, you understand the politics and we want to get that perspective. But before we get into it, I, I do have another question for you. So many businesses and foundations have launched special initiatives to support the need of, to social, for social change. Uh, towards African-Americans, many have boldly kind of made these clear statements. Uh, it almost seemed, uh, I think some are genuine, some are sincere, some is almost reactive to, to the moment. You've been doing that your whole, uh, your whole life, your whole career. Are, are you doing anything different or unique uh, given the, the moment to reinforce what you've been doing? Uh, and if so, what have you done either through the foundation or through the, the organization uh, through Elevation uh, Financial Group? Well, you know, and I'm, I'm grateful that organizations, you know, I don't, uh, I don't intend to kind of evaluate their, their sincere. I'm not in a position to evaluate their sincerity. I'm grateful that there's more energy and effort around these issues. Uh, we all have more we can do. And so that's what we're doing. You know, our scholarship program, 27 are going off in the fall. Uh, 18 new scholars just started their juniors in high school. They'll go off next year. You know, I've been at protests here with members of our firm, uh, uh, peaceful protests. Um, you know, I've been at faith vigils and walks with pastors where we're, we're praying over the lives of, of so many who have, have uh, been taken way too early. Um, you know, but I think there are things, there, there are little things, there's simple things that all of us can do. I've been, I've really been inspired by my wife. One of the things that's meant the most to her, because both of us, both of us interacted with these issues in ways I think a whole lifetime would not have allowed us to do, but for the election of 2018, it was the African-American community that really cared for me and my family about more better than really anyone. Um, I attended probably 150 churches across the state of Florida and built relationships with, with really civil rights leaders all over Florida. But one of the things that came out of that as we, as Kristen and I both uh, desire to try to understand these differences at a deeper way and she started first is, is really what, uh, you know, a lot of times if you don't have black uh, thinkers or writers or pastors or thought leaders or visionaries in your life, if you're not reading, you know, we have social media, but if you're not listening to other voices on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, if you're not reading the blogs of some of the nation's, you know, most incredible um uh, uh, leaders from the African American community, it's very difficult to understand some of these issues. I mean, we've been able to advance how we think, and but more importantly, that's been Kristen's focus, and she has been really sharing that with people, uh, particularly in the white community, about how important it is to diversify um, where you're getting your information, uh, not just because it's right, but also because it makes you richer uh, as a person. But then also for me, you know, I have so many um, friends, dear friends who are, are elected leaders, who are black elected leaders and or who are attempting to be black elected leaders. And so my really desire is how do I use whatever platform I've been able to build to really draw attention to them, uh, not because that's just uh, some, something I feel guilty about doing, but because they're so wonderful. And people need to know who they are and what they're doing. And once they know, they'll be changed. And so I think those are some of the things we've been trying to do here in the King family. So, so with that, let me ask you this question and then we'll get into the parts in a minute. So, so somebody, some, some whites may be listening uh, to you right now and, and, and they're saying, Chris, I, I really want to get to where you are. Um, uh, you, you know, help me. How, how do I at least get the level of empathy, the level of of passion you have about these issues? H you know, what would you advise me to do? Because to be honest, I'm, I have a hard time processing some of this because of, you know, I'm, I'm white. But you seem to have processed it a little better than what I've seen. What would you advise them to do? 
Well, um, you know, I, first, I, I think one of the biggest forces um, that it, it will move our nation forward is, is empathy and compassion. And if a person, no matter where they are in their journey, and we're all trying to figure this stuff out, and it's complicated, it's, nu it's nuanced, and sometimes I'm clunky in the way I think about it or talk about it. Um, um, and I, I remember I was having a great conversation with um, an African-American faith leader that I was very close to. And and I did something and they responded uh, to, to, to the extent they said, well, at least you're trying. Um, and I remember thinking, huh, <laughs> you know, I, thought I was doing more than trying. But there was a very sweet way of saying you're trying to get it. You may not be all the way there, but but I appreciate your heart. And I think that's I think that's what I would say to that person. You know, it, it's about effort. It's about curiosity. It's about recognizing, you know, it's, it's hard for us. It's really difficult. You know, it's like if you've never had cancer, I've never had cancer, but my mom is a breast cancer survivor. If I've never had cancer, I don't really know what it's like to show up for the first day of chemotherapy. I don't know what it's like. I've always, you know, I'm, I'm feeling prideful right now because of the injury and I, I look so strange with all these scars. But what would it look like to lose my hair? What does that feel like? Well, someone who's been through that experience has an authenticity and a power to that experience that they can share with someone else. Well, that's not what, unlike what it's like with these racial issues. You know, when somebody um, who has a darker hue than me is walking through life, when their experiences are so dramatically different, when the way people respond to them, there was a, a, a young man who's, who's staying, an outstanding young man who's staying uh, in my parents' uh, uh, guest house briefly as he spends his summer here. He's one of the best I've ever known, African-American. And my mom was telling me that, you know, when he moved in, and it's a predominantly white area where, where she lives, you know, he said to her, have you, have you told the neighbors, you know, have you told the neighbors that I'm going to be here this summer? And I thought to myself, you know, can you imagine walking through life um, with that kind of a concern and fear? Right. Because he was he was thinking already thinking ahead. What would the neighbors think when a young black man was coming in and out of the house, you know, every evening? Um, those are the simple differences, the simple realities that I think when more white folks really grapple with it, uh, their lives will be changed too. Wow. Chris, let's talk politics. You know, um, you know I'm a political junkie. And um, so you, you've alluded to this, but I want to get right to it. So um, how do you think the federal government has responded to the situation? Uh, let, let's first talk uh, the federal government and then we'll get to, con let's first talk the presidents, let's do the Congress. So what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? What would you do different from the way that, that Congress and the, the, the White House have responded to the situation? Sure. Well, you know, I think in these types of really public um, uh, dramas, these extremely difficult um, justice stories, you know, where most people go for their information is um, to our executive leadership. That's what I've found. I think this is a time where it's, it's very hard for the disparate voices of Congress uh, to get through, particularly with COVID and everything that's going on in the economy. So I think probably at the end of the day, most people are listening uh, to the U.S. president, uh, to our governors, often to our mayors in some of those key key cities where we have seen you know tremendous um, racial unrest since Mr. Mr. Floyd's murder. Um, and so, you know, uh, and, and I, I'm sure you're not surprised, uh, but I think this has been one of the darkest moments of the Trump presidency. Uh, I don't know if it will undo him. Uh, I certainly hope so uh, in terms of I hope for new leadership 
in the fall. I don't hope that America goes through something um, as difficult as it's going. And I certainly hope that he will find uh, a voice of, 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 of compassion, of empathy. But, you know, before some of your, your viewers who are perhaps big Trump supporters get all fired up, let's just look at the facts. You know, when Mr. Trump uh, says from the White House, uh, out looking at a peaceful protest across his lawn, that he is prepared in a gleeful notion uh, to release vicious dogs and the most ominous weapons. Uh, white Americans have to be assertive along with black Americans and say, we know just what he's doing. When he's talking about vicious dogs, we know he's given a dog whistle uh, to these kinds of uh, systemic challenges that has faced us since those historic photos of the 1960s that are seared into every American's imagination. When he use tear gas to clear out Lafayette Square so he could go across and hold up a Bible. Uh, you know, people of faith all across the country should have said, that's not, that's not what the Bible's about. That's not what people of faith, we, we, don't, use, we don't use that kind of power and, and, and violence to try to exploit our faith. Uh, we use it to serve and lift up people. And so, I've been deeply disappointed with his response both to the pandemic and to George Floyd's death. I think he is he has appeared to not be able to control these forces because some of the same tools he uses um, that rely on finding a scapegoat and creating division, always trying to blame it on something or somebody, whether it's Mexicans or immigrants. He's having a hard time doing that. And now he's got to do the hard work, work that I don't think he ever did in his lifetime. If you look at this, at how he built his businesses and how these discrimination issues have been following him since the 70s and his father well before that. Uh, this is this is in many ways. Uh, just the new version of those issues. And so it's made it made it very difficult. And in my state, our governor is essentially, um, you know, a, a, a version. He was installed by Trump um, and he, he, he works very closely with Trump and he parrots the same remarks that Trump parrots. And so uh, he's he's going to be the last voice. Our two senators and our governor, all Republicans, have provided almost zero leadership when it comes to trying to bring any substance to the issue of George Floyd's death. I think it's a misstep for them. I think it's a misstep for their their careers. Uh, but more importantly, I think it 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 uh, it misses the opportunity to bring down the tension and bring people together. I'm going to have you come back at a certain point, Chris, when we get closer to the election to, to really speak more about the election and its implication on social and business issues, as I would have the same thing for uh, those who are who are Republicans or, or, or for Trump. But let me ask this question. Some might listen to you and say, they'll say, well, Chris, of course you're going to say that because you're a Democrat, you ran for office. That's your talking point. What's your response to that? Yeah, I think that's a, a difference without a distinction. Um, you know, I ran for for office um, as a person of faith, as a business person, as also a member of the Democratic Party. Um, I'm pretty disciplined when I uh, provide a critique or commentary about someone in leadership. I never try to do it in a petty or mean or snarky way. Um, that's not who I am. It's not who I was as a candidate. Uh, and it's never been who I've been as a business leader. Um, but our problem, you know, many of the voices that need uh, to be changed, many of, uh, of many of those voters who need to be touched by this are folks who voted for Trump last time and who have enabled and empowered uh, his uh, really dangerous um, and, and ugly style of leadership, in my view. I don't believe 
uh, you know, you teach Patrice um, what a servant leader looks like. Um, and, uh, you know, that's always been the standard um, for me in the political arena. Um, I did not just just all of a sudden come out of the womb as a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, but as I developed my character and as my family helped develop my character, I recognized often that the people who were working on the issues I felt so strongly about um, uh, sometimes tilted that way. But I also know a whole lot of wonderful Republicans uh, who feel uh, just as, as powerfully about racial justice and social justice and opportunity for all. And they probably sometimes, and, and, and I've said this to my own party, they sometimes can give a very powerful critique about how we often can put too much emphasis on the government's role uh, to the loss of responsibility for people of faith or the private sector. Um, I've tried to fix that in my style of leadership, um, but we got to call a spade to spade. And right now our president's not getting it done. Our governor's not getting it done. We got some big problems in America. Uh, but Americans know how to do big stuff here in Florida. I'll end on this thought. This would have been an enormously inspiring story had it not been for what was happening down here. Uh, but a private company, SpaceX, sent two astronauts uh, to space just a week or so ago in a public private, extraordinarily successful partnership. Uh, business and government at its best, doing big things that inspire and bring people together. The space industry down here has often been something that's brought everybody together, Republicans or Democrats. And, uh, you know, I, I just wish our leadership on Earth uh, was every bit as good to do some of the big stuff we need to do right now. Wow. Wow. Well said. Chris, so um, there are many whites who support Donald Trump, who who have, who feel as though um, whether they're wearing the hat or support Donald Trump, they're perceived as racist uh, because of Donald Trump position or posture, his words. Uh, so is that, I mean, from your vantage point, is that a, is that a fair um, kind of argument? You know, is it right or fair for people to conclude that because you support that guy, you're racist. And 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 I understand your point that what he does is wrong and bad. It should be denounced. Um, but do you feel as well that for those who consider because they're white, they're therefore racist because they support him? Is that also a fair argument from your vantage point? Can can both coexist? I guess is my question. Can they support him while denouncing him, or is it one or the other? Or what do you what do you take on that? Yeah, I mean, I would never, you know, <laughs> I would I would never call somebody uh, directly a racist. I mean, that is um, that is a condition of the heart. Um, but I, I believe that that racism has been a huge part of the American experiment. And I think it's something uh, that that each of us must contend with to ensure that um, we are operating in the most just uh, and, and fair way for, for everybody in our midst. I think that the challenge those people, though, have to respond to is, are they going to continue to be quiet and silent and sit on the sidelines? Because, you know, smart people can rationalize anything. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, the president said uh, vicious dogs. The president used tear gas on peaceful protesters. Oh, the president seems to give you know misinformation on COVID-19 nearly every day, 10 times a day. Yes, he does. But the other guy, the other guy, the other party, they do this or that. You can make an argument for anything. You know, and I'm not I'm not telling somebody, although I'm a I'm a supporter of Joe Biden. I've met Joe Biden. I think he has the character and capacity to take this country in a whole different direction. Uh, and I think his biggest success and legacy will be ending this tenure of Donald Trump. Uh, that might be the thing that's most important about what he needs to bring to America to usher in a new, a new era of, of people working collaboratively. But, you know, it, it is a total fabrication to suggest that the Republican Party and leadership 
is somehow divided or at angst or, uh, you know, standing up to Donald Trump. Uh, that is not true. This is not the Republican Party that I, uh, when I was raised, I saw. This is a party that has fallen lock, stop, and barrel behind everything he's done. It's been terrible for communities of color across America. And so when Trump voters, I'm less concerned about what they're, whether they think they're being called a racist or not. I would reference my comments on white fragility. I don't think that internal debate is going to change America. I think what's going to change America is when we stand up uh, to people that are doing bad things and we say we're not going to allow it. And even though I'm a Republican, you know, a person who says I'm a Republican and I can't vote for Joe Biden because of X, Y, or Z, or I can't get behind that other candidate, but I'm not going to say that what he's doing is right. I'm going to use my voice. Well, I can tell you that person, there's an authenticity that will be remembered. And everybody in their life who's a person of color will remember that that person stood up and said when they needed to stand up uh, that they wouldn't uh, allow it. And that that's the only way we make a difference in America. Wow, wow, good. We come to close here. We're gonna have Chris back because um, as we get close to the, the election, um, I, I, I wanna have a Chris commentary as well as a, another commentary to help equip us as Christians as to how to think, how to process. The biggest danger right now with Christians is that um, you know the, the other side feels as though you can't be a Christian and be a Democrat. The other side, you can't be a Christian and be a Republican. There's this kind of divide among in the church. And of course, you know, black people, you can't be black and be a, Demo a Republican, right? And, and black, uh, white, black evangelical feel, how dare you be a Democrat? You know, it, there's this, almost this thing. And so I've asked Chris months ago, I'm sure you remember, actually last year, I think it was, I'm going to have him back because he's a man of faith and, and he's, he's, a, he's, a, um, he's, a, he's, a, he's part of the Democratic Party and to educate us. So that you as a Christian can hear from another Christian as to why you may want to consider Joe Biden or so and so, whatever the case may be. And and then and we're gonna ask a question around the things of faith, around business, because that's what we care about here, business and entrep entrepreneurship and faith. So they can help give us a way to process it outside of the sound bites, outside of the emotions, just the facts. And so we're gonna do that. But Chris, as we wrap up here. First of all, thank you for being candid and for being clear. Do you do you have any hope for America, given what's going on? Why and why not? Well, sure. I mean, I'm I'm a person of faith, right? So that kind of comes with the territory. Uh, you know, we we serve a great and loving God um, who often does some of His biggest and most powerful work in our darkest moments. Uh, but we got to be really realistic. This is a dark moment uh, in America. Uh, this is this is a time and it's not just because of Donald Trump. I'm not trying to pin all the blame. Please, if you're a Trump Trump supporter or fan, don't hear that. I recognize these are issues that are 400 years plus in the making. Um, but but, you know, just like in business, <laughs> where uh, Elevation has often done some of its most impactful work uh, when things were uh, darkest or bleakest in communities or businesses we went to. That was where huge value could be created. Well, we're in one of those moments in America, right, where this is really an opportunity where a new generation is saying, we want to create a more just, fair society. And, uh, you know, we need our leaders to catch up and to to accept the challenge and recognize it's not going to it's sometimes going to be two steps forward, one step back. But we got to we got to prepare our hearts uh, to do this important work. So, yes, I continue to, to be hopeful about America's future. Wow. Well said. Well, Chris, thank you so much, uh, guys. I'm not sure about you, but I, I've been blessed. Hey, listen. If you've enjoyed this podcast, share it, all right, share it. Uh, I don't want you to focus on the political positioning. I wanted to do a, an emphasis on politics because it's important for us to 
look at the political implication of what's happening. We're gonna have the same thing on the other side. Share it, share with us so that people can hear other perspective, particularly uh, to our white audience. Uh, I think that some of what Chris shared is worth considering as you process for yourself in terms of all the stuff that are happening, right? Here's a white person who has been able to kind of process uh, certain things with the black community. I think it's helpful to consider his experience as you think about how you yourself are gonna process it. I think it was very insightful. And also uh, we wanted you to share this because I think the media sound bites uh, and the internet gotchas is not helping us. Um, Chris is white. He's spoken, if you, he's spoken as though he was a pro-black guy. We had a somebody yesterday who was black, spoke as if she was a pro-white, you know, so it's not a color. It's a matter of values, it's a matter of faith, and it's a matter of conviction. So I think as long as we allow the debate to be around race and around division, we don't get anywhere, but it's about collaborative ways. Different folks of different races can have different views. And that is okay, as long as we are all pressing towards a collaborative process to make America better, stand for our faith and our conviction. So Chris, thank you for that. Thank you uh, for uh, being being uh, bold and, and courageous and honest with us. And then we do want you back because we wanna talk just pure politics and, and allow, to, and we wanna ask you questions because there are many people who wonder, how can a Christian be a Democrat? I want you to address those kind of things so that you can help us understand what goes well, on. And Patrice, I would just say they should just come to the black church with me and I'll show them. <laughs> There's a lot of us out there. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. That is great. Well, having said that, hey, listen, if you have really have enjoyed this podcast, I want to encourage you. We have a great number of resources on our website, NehemiahEntrepreneurshipGree.com, where we can provide you with coaching, uh, training, and access to capital in helping you walk out your journey on building a kingdom business. There, you can also learn about our initiative and our full response to the Jurful Initiative, which is number one, provide these kind of podcasts. We're dedicated for most of June, our podcast just around discussions around the Jurful Incident from different perspectives. The second thing, we are creating a devotional series called Journey to Freedom, a, a redemptive discussion around race and relationship and justice. Uh, we just have this week, we dealt with uh, the dream. Uh, next, we're gonna deal with the betrayal. Do you know that the betrayal was not just whites betraying blacks, but it really began in Africa with Africans betraying their own. And so what we wanna do is look at it prospectively. Do you know that slavery is an over 11,000 year old issue. So it's important for all of us to look at it. So we don't have to betrayal. There was a betrayal. There was a betrayal. And, and we gotta get past that. But we cannot just blame one group. We have to all take responsibility. Do you know that Africa demise today could be because of the role it played in this whole situation? Do you know that America, if we don't fix this, our future may not be as hopeful? because we must address the it at the root that Chris said it, 400 years of pain, tragedy, of inhumanity. This is our moment to fix it and to deal with it at the root. Well, so on, on uh, Monday, next week, we'll have to do that situation and ever we'll deal with a particular topic around the journey to freedom. Also, uh, we've uh, reignited the Urban Initiative. Uh, we, Charles Kears will be leading that effort to bring entrepreneurship education and economic development in urban communities. And lastly, collaborate with urban leaders in terms of how do we serve together across the political eye, across the races, working together to make a difference in urban communities. Having said that, I wanna leave you with this. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord enable you to use the talents and the skills he's placed on the inside of you to steward, to fulfill the purpose he's called you to fulfill so that one day, you can hear those wonderful words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. He will make you rule over much. God bless you. Do not leave yet until you watch this video. Nehemiah Week is an annual event designed to equip entrepreneurs and leaders from around the world to inspire and to honor marketplace leaders for their accomplishments 
and what they're doing to model Christ in the marketplace. God is doing incredible things in Nehemiah week. Ladies and gentlemen, God has called us to be a light for him, to be an example for him, to be a model for him so that as others see us, not hear us, but see us, they can see a model of Christ. Yeah, each year at Nehemiah week, we, we gather uh, the, the nations. Our vision is to transform the marketplace with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, one entrepreneur at a time. We have learned uh, to do business uh, in a godly way. Uh, and we'll actually spread this to our church as well. Through the course of Nehemiah Week includes information around um, principles of biblical entrepreneurship, so really looking at biblical economics. What we've learned this week is, is about training. Uh, Nehemiah uh, Project is about training and then coaching and then accessing capital. Nehemiah gave me God's vision. Really impacts the way that I see doing business. Nehemiah Week not only gives birth to new ideas, it connects us with resources and relationships that makes them possible. So what we want to do is not just affect here in the U.S. We want to take this curriculum all over the world. Whatever it is, the question is, what impact will this have on others? It's something that's going to change lives. So I'm ready to use whatever I have for the benefit of the kingdom of God. I believe that the nations are going to shape because of this week. Biblical entrepreneurship takes a stand to say we are going to be witnesses for Jesus Christ in the marketplace.